We hope everybody is doing well on this Friday. And thank you already for joining us for our event. So happy Friday, everyone, and uh, warmest welcome to today's event, our first live web talk, Sustainable Megacities Health, Risks and Resources. My name is Dietrich Wolfenner, and I'm the program manager of the German Center for Research and Innovation New York. And um, what we do is to showcase Germany as a land of research, science and innovation. And we do this with uh, events like this with our 17 great partners from the um, landscape, the German research landscape. And today's partners, our valued partners, um, are the University of Cologne, the Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg, the Heidelberg University, and we are the co-hosts, the German Center for Research and Innovation. We have five centers worldwide and we have an annual topic we work on together. And for 2020, it is cities and climate. So it makes perfect sense that we are talking today about sustainable megacities. If you're interested in this topic, please also look up our DVH New York website and our YouTube channel, and you will find the recording of our future forum, which we did last month about building Biopolis, the green city of the future. So you will find more content that is related to today's event. But now I'm short and sweet, very happy and proud um, that we do this event today on a sunny Friday in New York. And I hand over to my dear colleague, Dr. Eva Busbach. Thank you so much, Dietrich. And thank you everyone for joining us on a Friday. And I work for the University of Cologne uh, running uh, our North America office in New York. And it is our great pleasure to welcome you all to the first event in the series, Sustainable Megacities, Health, Risks, Resources, by the German Center for Research Innovation, uh, DVIH New York, and the North American Liaison Offices of Universities of Heidelberg, Freiburg, and Cologne. Today is our first event. Uh, in the and the spotlight will be on megacities research at the University of Cologne, and we hope you can uh, join us for the other two spotlight events featuring researchers from the universities of Freiburg and Heidelberg, and also for a joint event with all the speakers on May uh, 6, 2021. Freiburg, Heidelberg, and Cologne are all top-ranked German research universities that have a long tradition in research being founded already in the 14th and 15th century, respectively. Today, join us from the University of Cologne, which is also one of the largest universities in Germany with 50,000 students and many international students and researchers. Such as our office in North America, we also maintain offices in India and China. And perhaps some of you are joining us upon their invitation today from different time zones. I would like to point out to you just a few uh, large internationally recognized research areas at the University of Cologne, most of which actually play a role when thinking about the opportunities and challenges of megacities, such as the mechanisms of aging and aging associated diseases, behavioral economic engineering and social cognition, quantum matter and quantum materials, plant sciences and food security, skills and structures in language and cognition, and the socio-economic, cultural and political transformations in the Global South, where I would like to especially highlight our Institute of Geography with Professor Frauke Kras and Dr. Carsten Butch, who will be our speakers today. We created this event series for you because we share the opinion that urbanization is fundamentally changing societies and landscapes all over the world, and that those major transformations are partly understood and bring many challenges with them, some of which now the COVID-19 pandemic has made highly visible. And that in order to develop more sustainable ways managing the multiple risks and health challenges, 
of urbanization, we should learn from experts and from other regions in the world, such as today from South and Southeast Asia. And by doing that, we can gain a deeper understanding of mega urban governance, management, and culturally adapted forms of participation in civil societies. Before I hand it over to our distinguished speakers, allow me to thank everyone who made this series possible, our partner, the German Center for Research and Innovation, DVIH New York, and its fantastic team, including Julia, and also Amanda D'Aquila and Marta Miller, director of the North American Liaison Offices of the Universities of Heidelberg and Freiburg, and Antun Guyen and Marie Kallenberg from our office. Thank you all very much. We will now hear from our speakers, Frauke Kras, who is professor for, for human geography at the University of Cologne, where her research focuses on mega urban and regional development, transformation processes, urban heritage, urban health and disaster risk research in Southeast Asia and India. She's also chair of the expert network Forum for Urban Future in Southeast Asia. Our other speaker is Dr. Karsten Butch, also from the Institute of Geography at the University of Cologne, who works in the field of urban health and risks with issues such as access to health, health monitoring and urban health risks in India and Indonesia. Dr. Butch is the speaker of the study groups on medical and health geography and South Asia of the German Geographic Society and member of the Commission on Research on Pandemics of the German Research Foundation, BFG. He also has a connection to North America where work at the Richmond Ambulance Authority in Virginia actually paved his way into geographical health research. So one last thing, please type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen on the bottom right. And we are looking forward to a Q&A session after the presentations. We will now first hear from Dr. Butch and after that from Professor Kras. Thank you for being with us today and over to you, Dr. Butch. Yes, uh, from my side, thank you very much for this nice introduction and for uh, organizing this event. I think our slides should start in a second. Yes. So uh, what you can see here is the title of this whole event here, Sustainable Megacities, Health Risks and Resources. And you see resources here in red. And the reason is that this is the one thing we won't talk about. Uh, I will in the first part talk about health issues. And then in the second part, uh, my colleague Frauke Kras will talk about risks. Next slide, please. So what you can see is, uh, again, the announcement for this event and uh, the overarching question we would like to answer over this, or at least contribute to the answer um, for uh, over the event series is uh, the management of health risks and resources is challenging. What is required to achieve more sustainable mega cities? I think we will, over the series of events, you will hear different answers to that and maybe in the end, uh, we can move a little bit uh, into that thinking of more sustainable megacities. What are actually the main challenges? So that's what we as presenters hope to um, contribute to. Next slide, please. Uh, what you see here is a map of megacities in the year 2025. So five years from here. And this map actually, and the information below actually gives you an idea why megacities are such a fascinating topics. In the, uh, if you look at the bullet points below, you will see that the number of megacities has been increasing tremendously in the last years. And uh, if I can just direct your attention to the last bullet point, if you look at uh, the development of um, especially Asian megacities, you can actually see from these figures, these dynamics. Um, when you look, for example, at Dhaka, in 1970, Dhaka had 1.5 uh, inhabitants. It has grown 14 times between 1970 and 2025 to then 20.9 million inhabitants. These are just figures, uh, but if you are, and I can promise you from having been in several uh, South Asian megacities, if you are there, you can really feel that uh, transformation and that, that power which is there. And that is actually what makes it also for us as researchers such an interesting topic to really see this urban transformation going on. 
And we, um, Frauke Kars and I, we really think that those mega cities are the those spaces which are the most extreme um, outcomes and products of this urban transformation process we actually see in South Asia at the moment. So next slide, please. What do we want to tell you in the next or talk about in the next minutes? Uh, there will be a short introduction in which I talk about vulnerability and social disparities, which will be the connection between our two parts. Uh, and the first part uh, of this presentation will address mega urban health issues. And the second part uh, by Frauke Kahrs will address mega urban risks. And uh, Frauke Kahrs will also uh, draw some conclusions from uh, the case studies which we present. And we'll also talk about approaches, strategies and tools for mega urban sustainability contributing in that way also to the overarching question. Next slide, please. Well, one of the topics or one of the central topic of our talk is are the social disparities and vulnerability. And I chose this picture, which I took um, in Delhi to illustrate social disparities, um, because what you can see here is in the front, you see, can see tents in which temporary it's a temporary informal settlements where construction workers live. And those construction workers are working on the construction sites, building the high rises, which you can see um, on the horizon there. And uh, when we look at these social disparities, it always seems as these are worlds apart, but these are not worlds apart, but they're strongly connected. Here, there's a direct relationship because we have the construction workers building those new enclaves, which are there. But uh, what we see in these informal settlements, actually, they are also persistent. And in a couple of years, they will be probably leaving those people who are uh, doing the laundry and cleaning the floors in these houses. So we have these on a very close space, very high social disparities. But these are not worlds apart, but very much connected elements in these mega cities. But the vulnerability of the people living in those high rise buildings and those in those informal settlements are very different. Next slide, please. And vulnerability um, is related to two factors. It has a double structure. It's on the one hand, the exposure towards risks, towards health threats, which is different in the tents in the foreground and the high rise buildings in the back, but also the coping capacities. How can we deal with shocks? These are two points which add up, and this would be uh, well, one of the themes which uh, which we would like to talk about. Um, the internal and the external side of vulnerability, coping and exposure related to social um, disparities. Next slide, please. This is a picture which uh, you probably have seen in the press. Um, it's um, related to India and what I will present you about um, mega urban health issues will be mostly related to um, examples from India. Um, what you see here in these pictures are the most vulnerable populations we find in megacities. These are the temporary workers. And um, you might have noticed or uh, taken from the press that in India, um, those temporary construction workers during the COVID-19 crisis have been expelled from the cities. They were forced to leave under real, um, sometimes even cruel circumstances. And this is what you can see on this picture. But um, even before that, those construction workers, those temporary migrants, were actually among the most vulnerable people when it comes to health issues in um, mega cities. Next slide, please. This is um, and I'm. This is one example which I came across during my fieldwork for my PhD thesis when I was working in a temporary construction site. And you can already see that this is. Um, very temporary shelter um, with very unhealthy living conditions. You can see people are forced to store water, uh, their drinking water in these um, vessels here in the front. And you can imagine in uh, when it is summertime, 40 degrees, how these metal sheet homes are really not very, uh, very comfortable places. And what is actually quite interesting, these are people who live in a mega city. And in these mega cities, you have um, health services at your doorstep which are of really high class international standard. But the problem is those people cannot really access those healthcare services. And this was something which I found always very um, yeah, disturbing. And uh, next slide, please. 
I brought you um, a quote from, from an interview which I did with one of these construction workers living here. That person told me, if I would seriously get ill, I would go to a physician, but I don't know where. I'll have to see and find out. If I'm seriously ill, then the boss will send me back home to the village. There's a government hospital and a doctor in my village. There are facilities there, so I would go there, I would rest there, and then I would come back when I'm finding it. So I found that really interesting. Um, so those people are really in a city where they have the best healthcare facilities available, but they go home to their village, to a rural place. And that actually is a very, um, well, fascinating or, or um, yeah, sh showing in a very direct way how vulnerable those people are because they do not have the coping capacities, although they would have all these services at their doorstep. Next slide, please. Having said this, I would like to talk a little bit more about um, which factors actually influence health in cities of low and middle income countries. And uh, following that, I would like to um, address three major trends which are changing health in low and middle income countries at the moment. So when you look at these factors which are influencing uh, that are shown on this slide, you can actually see that you can group factors which affect mega urban health in three um, sectors. These are society, environment, and the health systems. And those factors can be grouped on three uh, scales. It's, that is the supranational scale, the regional scale, and the local scale. And if you look, for example, at health systems, um, we have on the, on the global scale, medical knowledge. Um, and there are supranational health organizations and um, ideas and programs which are informed by the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals. And when you look at the national um, scale, the way how healthcare services are organized and healthcare systems are organized, what is the financing systems? Do we have health insurances or not? Do we have primary healthcare or not? The education of um, medical staff, all that is decided on the national scale. And then when you look at the local scale, uh, you can uh, look at the number of healthcare providers, their quality, um, how accessible are there, um, are there any healthcare monitoring activities taking place on the local level, um, are there preventive services offers, etc. And for the three dimensions, you can actually go through the different scales and see um, more or less direct factors influencing the health status of urban population, which is at, is at the heart of this um, graph. And what is also very important, uh, the health status is actually inequitable. That's the term we use in medical sciences. It's inequitable because it's very much influenced by the um, socioeconomic status. That's something which is uh, very um, obvious in these um, in these areas, which are um, well shaped mainly by. Um, social disparities. So that's uh, one of the main features of urban health in um, low and middle income countries. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, I would like to draw your attention also to three major changes which are occurring at the moment in uh, low and middle income countries and the cities. The first one are, is a, a health transition or actually health transitions. I would rather lose, use the plural here. And these health transitions are showing, for example, in a change in the burden of disease. You see here for India, uh, the main causes of death for 2005 on the left side and for 2016 on the right side. And what you can see is that the um, communicable diseases and uh, yeah, communicable diseases, which are shown in red, they are actually going down. So their relevance is decreasing while um, non-communicable diseases are on the rise. Um, for example, I would like to draw your attention on to diabetes, which was the um, in 2005, the 13th most important factor um, or most important um, cause of death. And it's now the seventh most important. And diabetes is something which is um, getting quickly more prevalent in India. Um, and the problem with that is that um, these non-communicable diseases, chronic diseases usually need a long-term um, treatment, which is very cost intensive and the public health care sectors are not catered for that. So they are not really prepared to provide these services. Next slide, please. 
A second change is, uh, or a second very important feature are the urban healthcare systems, which are getting more diverse. Most of the um, so-called low-income countries have uh, theoretically good organized public sectors, which you see at the right side, uh, at the left side, sorry. But at the right side, you see that, and that's actually uh, true for almost all low and middle income countries. We have quickly emerging private sectors, which are unregulated and which are also, um, yeah, which are not always offering adequate services. And that's something I will talk about a little bit later. The next slide, please. And one thing which is also very related to that, and that's also a very distinct feature of low and middle income countries, we have a high, very high medical diversity. That means we have a lot of different healthcare systems being practiced. And these pictures, which I show on this slide, are just um, symbolic uh, or, or extreme examples. On the one hand, you have a, um, a hospital which is internationally certified. On the uh, left side, you have a very traditional practitioner offering Ayurvedic um, healthcare, but you have very different. Um, medical systems, um, which is on the one hand, could be uh, something which, um, because we have a lot of different types of knowledge, which could be a corner store or one building block for uh, sustainable strategies, because we have a lot of traditional knowledge, which is there. Uh, but on the other hand, this medical diversity can also um, result in negative effects, especially if uh, the treatment is not always adequate. Also on that, I will talk a little bit later. The next slide, please. Having said this, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, this dual structure of vulnerability again, coming back to that, and about the exposure and coping capacities. So when we talk about the exposure, it's clearly the different factors um, which I mentioned earlier. And uh, these pictures are just to symbolize some of these uh, negative exposures, especially uh, persons with a lower socioeconomic status face. For example, at the top left, you see a typical um, stuff where people are cooking and you see that they're using firewood. And uh, this is clearly related to um, air pollution and the people are um, really getting affected negatively with uh, chronic pulmonary diseases resulting from that. The, on the upper right side, you see problems related to the water supply. Um, the um, lower bottom right picture shows a little bit the general unhealthy living conditions environments. And the bottom left picture illustrates um, hazardous occupations. This is a scrap dealer, a picture um, from a workshop of a scrap dealer, which I took from outside. So these are just, uh, ideas to give you an, uh, or pictures to give you an idea about the different exposures to negative health uh, effects for um, persons with a low socioeconomic status. Next slide, please. But on the other hand, uh, one point which I mentioned already earlier, when you look at the coping capacities, if people are suffering from ill health, uh, one coping strategy is um, attending the medical sector. But the access to healthcare services is especially in um, in India. That's a case study where I did my PhD. Is actually um, a very difficult. Uh, uh, it's very difficult, and it's very much also related to socioeconomic status, um, which I will show you in a uh, in the next slides. But when we talk about access to healthcare, what do we actually mean by that? Um, the access to healthcare is defined as the ability to utilize adequate preventive, curative, and custodial medical care. And we have um, in, in science identified six dimensions in which barriers and facilitators are located that determine this access. Um, I will not go into details for these six dimensions, but I will give you an example. Um, when I show you one of the tables in a, in a comprehensive analysis. So um, it's just important that you keep in mind that the um, that it's the adequate uh, healthcare services that are important because that's related to um, the medical diversity which we see. A lot of people are, for example, um, going to traditional practitioners which are not trained in what we call Western medical or allopathy, 
but uh, those practitioners would still prescribe antibiotics and things like that. So people do access healthcare services, but they do not adic uh, access adequate healthcare services. So that's one of the big problems which arise from this uh, medical pluralism, which we see. Next slide, please. So um, my, for my PhD thesis, I um, analyzed access to healthcare services in Pune. Pune is an emerging mega city, and what you can see on this slide is uh, in the different shades of green here, um, the growth of the city. Um, Pune was the capital of a larger um, kingdom which ruled until the British invaded uh, um, this kingdom, the Marathas. They ruled actually part, a large part of South India. And um, what you can see in this darkish color in the middle is the extension of the city before the um, British rule. Then you can see that the British added some uh, cantonments outside. And then you see um, in the lightest green shade here, um, the growth since 1947. And um, in, our in my research, I tried to, um, to um, actually take this, well, in the differentiation of the city into consideration when choosing my um, research sites. Next slide, please. So I um, always took a pair of one slum settlement and one middle class settlement. This would be in the old part of the city. So on the left side, you can see a cons consolidated slum. On the right side, you see uh, um, this really traditional housing structures. Next slide, please. This is uh, from the British cantonment. On the left picture, you see uh, one of these nice alleys with banyan trees where um, colonial bungalows can be found. And on the right side, you see one of these temporary um, slums in which construction workers live. Next slide, please. And this would be on the, um, on the edge of the city. This is an area which has been developed 10 years before I did my interviews there. And also there you find a very unique structure. These are high-rise buildings, so-called housing societies. These are kind of gated communities. And uh, also there you find interspersed always slum settlements, which, um, as I said, have always also a relation to these um, newly constructed middle-class areas. Next slide, please. So I have been working, uh, I've been analyzing the access to healthcare services in these six neighborhoods. And what I want to show you uh, is, first of all, in the, if you look at the last row, uh, you can see that um, when you look at the six dimensions which actually shape the access to healthcare, it's mainly the affordability, so financial issues which limit the access to healthcare, and awareness. So people do actually not have the orientation in the healthcare sector to find adequate access to healthcare services. So these are for the whole of Pune are the most important findings. But I'd also like to um, draw your attention to the um, to that um, fourth row, the containment construction worker slums. Those uh, temporary migrants, they are actually the ones who have the worst access to healthcare services. Um, the availability of services, so, so the sheer number is not a problem for them. The spatial accessibility of healthcare facilities is also not a problem because they have everything at their doorstep. But they face problems in the acceptability. That means they are uh, they are facing stigma and discrimination because they usually come from other parts of the country. Um, they have problems in the dimension accommodation, which is, for example, about opening times because during their working or their, their free time, the um, government. Um, facilities will not be open. They um, have severe deficits in the dimension of awareness because they do not know about the local healthcare systems and may also have language problems. And also in the affordability, they are the most poor groups. And so they also will have problems uh, purchasing private services. Um, the next slide, please. So uh, drawing a small in-between conclusion before I hand over to Frauke Kras. Um, when we look at health and vulnerability in Asian megacities, um, one of the, if you look at the current situation, the double of burden of disease is actually one of the most severe problems. The double burden of disease means that we, have the, at the one hand, have still a very high 
rate of uh, communicable diseases, while at the same time, the non-communicable chronic diseases are uh, on the rise. Um, and the problems which are associated to that is um, that we have um, healthcare systems which are not prepared for that. Furthermore, when we look at the healthcare systems, we have a lack of regulation. So especially the private practitioners are not regulated and offer often care which is not adequate. And uh, the medical pluralism, which, as I said, can be seen as a chance because we have a very wide traditional knowledge, which is also preserved there, but also a threat if those practitioners do not provide adequate care. Now, when we look at the future, and that's also what we want to talk about a little bit today, um, there was a couple of challenges coming up. So uh, one of the challenges is the change in demographics. We have a rapidly changing age structure um, and new household composition. So the traditional system of care for old people uh, whose number is increasing does not really work. That would be a severe challenge to organize that. Um, the current urbanization patterns which we see actually create unhealthy cities. We have a lot of pollution. Um, the urban climate is negatively affected by these high-rise buildings which are built up. Those cities, and I can really talk from my own experience, are not very walkable. And uh, the housing structures we built at the moment, or the city structures we built at the moment, they will be the environment uh, which affects the health of people for future generations. So I think we have a window of opportunities or window of missed opportunities at the moment. Um, health systems reforms, which are taking place in most low and middle income countries, are at the moment mainly looking at privatization of healthcare systems. And that will um, make access to healthcare services, in fact, much more inequitable. So that's one of the, um, these are the main challenges I see. And when we look at the current situation and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we can actually see or understand that our health sitting in Bonn or in New York or from wherever you're listening, is very much interlinked also to the health of the people who are living in uh, slums in, in Delhi or Pune. So not only from an ethical point of view, we should be interested in uh, increasing um, the health also of vulnerable populations, which would be good in one good enough reason, but also out of our own self-interest, we should be interested in uh, achieving a better global health. So um, having said this, we actually would need new approaches towards um, mega urban health um, to build sustainable mega cities and to build, to contribute to a sustainable global health. Having said this, I would like to hand over to Frauke. Yeah, thank you very much, Carsten. Um, what makes megacities so, so special? I think the example shows very clearly um, we have very diverse, very dynamic cities. And let me summarize um, against the background that we are working mainly in Asia. Um, let me summarize the most um, important characteristics um, which make megacities so special and uh, why they need and deserve attention. First, it's highest concentrations, of course, of population numbers, densities, but also the infrastructure, huge infrastructure developments um, we can see over the last um, decades, economic units, the capital decisions. So whatever is there is concentrated in megacities with highest dynamics, demographic growth, the expansion, the land use, land cover changes are so quick, particularly in the urban fringe. Um, urban economics, we have globalized markets, we have the informal sector and both and all these um, wide range of um, dynamics are unfolding there. We have a superimposition of processes. So processes take place simultaneously, they amplify, uh, we have reciprocal uh, reactions. Partly they are leading to turning, partly they are leading even to tipping points. The Asian crisis, for instance. Um, then, as Carsten um, made very clear, I think, is we have very strong disparities, uneven developments. We have fragments of very different uh, ways of um, urban parts, segregation, um, disparities. Partly even we find that um, 
the so that social cohesion has gone lost or at least is disturbed um, tremendously. And we have higher socioeconomic vulnerabilities in megacities as um, in respect to the diversity of population. They are very often leading political centers. So if something happens there, the entire country is affected. Um, vulnerability also in terms of economic networks, the dependency, for instance, think about big flood events um, where while each and everything is concentrated in the mega cities, the entire country is suffering. Unfortunately, in many of the mega cities, we have limited steering capabilities in some even a loss of governability due to the combination of weak administration, partly planning and steering capacities, and also the lack of, of knowledge, lack of finances, lack of stuff. So when we are thinking about sustainable development, um, we need to understand mega cities and mega urban societies at least in two directions. The one is they are because they are so diverse, we have so strong dynamics, a very complex um, combination of phenomena and processes. We need to think about space, different spaces in megacities, which are very, very diverse. On the other hand, space is not enough. And too often have we been talking about different spaces only. But the different needs and vulnerabilities in the diverse parts of the societies are even more important. And I would like to have the next slide, please. For quite some time, megacities have been perceived and are still perceived as wealthy, privileged, well-developed. They are in the role of being motors of a society, gateways. This is where the power, the innovation, creativity. Of course, the universities are the powerhouses of development. So for many, megacities are just the very positive sides of agglomeration of wealth, privilege, and so forth. But we also have to see, and this is now more and more changing also within the communities in the megacities, let alone um, the governments. Megacities also have to be seen as centers of multiple risks, natural ones, human-made hazards, pollution, congestion, informality, diseases, crimin criminality, injustice. Next, please. And I would like, after Carsten has now um, gave kind of um, an overview over the urban health issues, I would like to look deeper into mega urban risks. And um, it's very clear, as most of the mega cities lie in coastal and delta regions, um, that high numbers of population are affected. So most are lying in these areas, coastal zones, large deltas, being high risk areas. In this low elevation coastal zone, um, just to give the dimension, um, the land area of these low um, elevation and coastal zone is just 2.3 percent of the co of the total land areas in all coast coastal countries. But if we look at the year 2000, we see that about 10, almost 11 percent of the total population worldwide, this was 625 million people lived in these coastal and delta regions concentrated in um, in the mega cities and 83 of those people lived in less developed countries with a density of of in, on average 240 people per square kilometer um, it is evident that these mega cities are vulnerable spaces they can be seen as high risk areas the projections for 2030 might they are they are they are different kind of projections. Some say it may maybe around uh, around 900 million people. Others say it will um, might may even go much larger. So we are talking about huge numbers of people in these coastal and delta mega cities. 2060 probably up to about 1.4 billion people. 12 percent. Um, of the then world population. Next, please. To give you an example, in 2011, the primate city of Bangkok, the capital of Thailand, where actually in this primate city, 
more than 30 times more population lives than in the second largest city of that country, by the way, the highest primacy index in the world, vast floods um, came um, and stayed for about four to five months with a, with a quite high number of casualties. About 9 million people lost their accommodation in Thailand. The problem with this primate city was about 3.2 million people were affected alone in this mega city of Bangkok. Infrastructure networks were almost completely blocked, as you can see in the picture. Um, actually, the skyways flyovers were used to park the cars in order to uh, prevent them from getting drowned. More than 10,000 companies in the industrial estates were weeks, partly months, um, without any chance um, to produce. The economic losses added up to about 24 billion euro. Economic growth had to be corrected down to 2.6. The problem that most, the utmost um, number of private households were not insured, therefore had to pay the price of reconstruction. Um, the reconstruction alone of that one flood event um, was estimated to be around 3% of the entire um, um, GDP of, of Thailand, mostly to be borne by the civil society. But it also had effects far um, further than Bangkok. Several ten thousands of migrants from the neighboring country had neighboring countries had to go back to their home countries. Um, we do not even know how many had to go back because many of them were just informal workers without reg registration. The consequences were very high. The vulnerability was affecting the gated communities, which you can see in the in the lower bottom, um, was um, affecting the gated communities, the middle income groups very strongly. They lost their jobs, they lost their homes, um, not being insured, let alone the people living in informal settlements, particularly in the urban fringe area. And I didn't bring the maps um, due to um, time constraints, but it was very clear that the dikes um, protecting the inner part of the city, they worked protecting the inner parts, but left the outer parts almost entirely um, insecure. Next, please. We've been working in a number of cities over the last um, almost two decades. And I would like in the following to summarize a number of lessons learned, which we learned from the floods in Bangkok, in Yangon, Myanmar, in Jakarta, Indonesia, Bombay, Mumbai, and Ho Chi Minh City. So um, what, what was very evident in almost all the sites was this high diversity and fragmentation of the urban setting, which these pictures may give a certain um, idea from, this high diversity is requesting a very specific answer from the institutions, from the neighborhoods, from the civil society, from the private sector. Next, please. And in order to understand this complexity of so different fragments of spaces, of so many different fragments of, of um, population groups, of this diverse societies, it is necessary to, um, to work with multi-method approaches in order to understand that there are various layers. So what, what we have been working with is a number of, um, well, classical methods from expert interviews to questionnaires, of course, but we have been living, we have been working with um, the people um, we have we have done um, kind of participatory urban appraisal methods, observation, and so forth. Next, please. In order to come closer to what I would like to summarize um, in the following slides. The diversity of risks and hazards which we find in, in mega urban areas um, needs special attention. They are partly sudden. We have slow onset um, risks from floods to tsunami to tropical storms, but also over congestion, pollution, health risk, as Carsten touched them, social conflicts, unrest, industrial accidents, and so forth. 
in many of the megacities, we find multiple risk settings and still many of the um, government employees of the administration talk about mainly natural hazards, natural risks. But what is very evident is that most of those risks we are, we are dealing with are human made. Why has Bangkok to be built in a flood plain in the Delta where at least once every two, three, five years, there is a large flood? Why build the houses there? Why expand in such an uncomfortable area in terms of um, urbanization? Many of the consequences are actually human made, are, um, are reinforced by, um, by the settings. And we would rather like to talk about complex, what we call NATEC home, so natural, technical, and human risks, a combination of multiple risks and many layers of risks which, which um, come together. What is also evident, and I think um, the example of Fukushima brought that to all our attention, was that what we find there is not just single events. We have multiple events. They, they are reinforcing themselves, and sometimes they are even cascading. They are cascading. Um, COVID-19 is a, is a very clear example. So we have different types of risks cascading currently in um, the largest cities. Next, please. The lessons we learned is we need to deal with space. We do not have even distribution. There are certain hotspots. And whenever we want to, um, to draw the attention to immediate um, action, it's those hotspots, say, along rivers or in, in informal settlements. What became evident to us also is that time matters a lot. In most megacities, we have been working at the first 72 hours were decisive. So immediate action before the official action could start, this requires the local communities um, to work hand in hand with each other, not just waiting for governments or other um, institutions to help them. Human actress, um, very obvious to us was that we have a very uneven risk awareness in the, in the societies, an in, inappropriate risk government governance, diverse populations, sometimes not even the languages um, were dealt with. So risk communication usually has been, um, has been given in just a few languages, let alone those of migrants coming from other countries or from um, areas where the um, main languages are not spoken. An uneven, uneven exposure, reasons, motives, and reactions and actions to threats, hazards, and risks in fragmented societies play a huge role. Early warning and risk com communication needs to be adjusted to the diversity, the diversity of actors, institutions, companies, civil societies in order to reduce damages. But in most of the megacities, we do not have those kind of appropriate forms of risk communication. It should be directed to those um, further regions and groups connected with the mega urban areas, but it is actually not connected. The population is diverse, can partly flexibly react. What we find in all this, all our cities is an innovative reaction. For instance, the role of the neighborhoods play a decisive role. Multiple supply um, in terms of deficits, for instance, neighborhoods are giving supply in times when government and administration cannot even start to react. Partly, of course, we have conflicts. So what we would like to underline is that strategies of self-regulation and coping um, play a significant role in the megacities, particular in these early hours and the, the, uh, the first days after um, a disaster starts. Next, please. So what we build up is um, a complex adaptive system approach in which we try 
for in which we tried for our um, different cities try to understand in which way immediate factors first degree second degree factors unanticipated factors hazards which triggered um, certain cascades factors that amplified um, certain developments were connected with each other so distinguishing secondary uh, sorry primary risks secondary tertiary and even quaternary risks which were connected with the first the second and the third in order to name and in order to map and visualize the effects of those different kinds of processes more clearly to the governments but also to the civil societies in order to identify those processes where action was required and where action could help next please could help um, to cut cascading risks to develop further so the key idea to visualize those complex adaptive systems to visualize them and to make them actually to to map them to make them clear to all those involved is to point to those factors where um, further cascading further amplification of effects could be stopped eff um, effectively next please so when we are talking about sustainable mega cities we think that we should focus because there are too many factors processes actors a very complex um, situation we would like to suggest to focus on those action fields which bear the potential of leverage effects so transformative action fields um, with the biggest potential of leverage leverage effects for an urban transformation towards an improved sustainability and we would like to summarize um, our work in the direction of six key points of leverage um, namely energy and climate change adaptation dealing with resources and material flows dealing with the urban form and land tenure focusing on mobility and transport focusing on urban health and multiple risks and focusing on socioeconomic disparities and vulnerability next please what do we need in our view we need new approaches more much more holistic and complex approaches which are adapted to mega urban dynamics and fragmentation what we also need is to look deeper into the individual mega cities because we have a very unique setting of diversity of population groups stakeholders and networks what is needed is a more integrated um, or more integrated approaches to governance in a broader sense multi-level cooperation self-organized networks are important and communication based approaches in order to help the communities to adapt flexible to change um, um, flexibly and quickly in case of um, emergency situations what needs to be included is approaches where we can integrate situations and times of uncertainty such as what we are currently facing with COVID. next please in which direction may new strategies and tools go focusing on most affected spaces focusing on most affected communities focusing on the immediate first 72 hours after such an such a disaster looking for good governance institutions to be connected strengthening polycentric decentralized models further strengthening civil society especially the neighborhood um, level the communities families integrating the private sector for instance with integrating them into relief action donations um, into these different ways of informality from above looking into multi-stakeholder focus and 
integrate technical tools without replacing human flexibility and responsibility. Next, please. The open questions remain, and this is my last slide. Open questions remain. How do we deal actively with uncertainty? As far as we know, um, and as far as we have been working in a number of megacities until now, in none of them is this question of uncertainty being dealt with. Is it possible to anticipate impossible situations? Is it meaningful to think about the unthinkable? How to combine different kinds of knowledge, data, experience? How to strengthen so social memories as knowledge pools? How can we develop capacities for a more systematic, innovative knowledge generation in a broader sense? How to strengthen flexible adaptation? And how to, how to also strengthen public engagement, particularly in these very fragmented societies. So Carsten Butch and I, we hope that with this overview, we could give some food for thought. We from our side, we would like already now um, to thank already the team. Um, we would also like to thank very much the audience who we cannot see. Unfortunately, we wished to, uh, to be able to. And we are now looking very much forward to a vivid discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kras and Dr. Butch, for all these insights on megacities in Asia and also providing us with lessons learned and further questions. We have received many questions from the audience. Thank you so much to everyone for being such an active audience. And also thank you for Dr. Butch for answering many of them already right in the Q&A box. So um, let's start with the more general question from Johanna Riel. Uh, maybe to you, Dr. Butch, how is the megacity defined? How many inhabitants does a city need in order to count as a megacity? Uh, well, the short answer would be, uh, if you look at the definition of the United Nations, uh, they say it's 10 million. But uh, now the problem actually starts because where are the limits of the city? Um, for example, if you look at Mumbai, um, the core city would Probably, if you just look at the core city, this would, I think, not even cross the 10 million threshold. But if you look at all these, um, well, at the surrounding, at the um, at the next um, governing bodies, which are actually part of the city, at the of the whole mega urban agglomeration, then it adds up to um, 20 million people almost. So um, that's a big question. So if you look at the definition of the United Nations, it would be 10 million, but yeah, as I said, it's really difficult to to define a close border for that. But maybe Frauke, you can also add on that. Yeah, well, um, actually, yeah, it's a very academic discussion, whether it's five, it's eight or 10 millions. Um, actually, I prefer the five million um, for one reason. If we um, if we take a, um, a smaller number, we can already identify the emerging megacities, those where huge dynamics take place. Um, Actually, these are numbers. Um, for some of the megacities, we do not even know how many inhabitants live there. Um, in the time in which I, I worked and lived in Bangkok, for instance, every year more than 500, 600, sometimes 700 people arrived and went back already. So they they were kind of breathing. Um, so when there was the agri there was nothing to do in the agricultural areas. People came to Bangkok, worked there for three months, and went back. So, what is it? What is the, what is what are the population figures? If such a breathing takes place with five hundred or even more five hundred thousand or even more people, so more important are for megacities are the um, characteristics of this high dynamics of this strong connectivity with globalization. Those are qualities which um, I think are much more important than just sheer numbers. Thank you very much. Um, next question was for you anyway, Professor Kras, and I have the allowance from the DVH that we can go a little bit over time here. So uh, whoever has time, uh, stay, we will do maybe five minutes more max uh, to take some of the questions. Um, how has lack of finances with the government health system been assessed? 
Yeah, thank you very much for that question, Professor Agarwal. Actually, I saw you were very uh, you were re very active in the Q and A. Thanks a lot. Um, in two cases, we have um, tried to um, to make an assumption how much is needed for, say, technical equipment. Um, how about finances for for staff? So we tried to sum up what would be needed in case of a disaster to, for instance, care for the delivery of goods, how many goods were needed, where. So um, actually, lack of finances concerns the staff, concerns the um, the immediate help, concerns the um, um, the rebuilding of, of um, key structures, concerns the critical infrastructure, how to keep that critical infrastructure, like fire department, like com uh, communication system, and so forth. So we have tried to add that up, and um, the lack of finances actually in some of the megacities go up to about three times the budget which the megacities do have. This holds true for the case of Bangkok, and um, another case was Yangon, where it was very clear that um, such provision of material wouldn't be able uh, to, to be delivered. Thank you. I have a question from Peter. As far as stabilizing the rural to urban migration is concerned, is it realistic to think about mitigating common push factors through multilateral approaches such as land redistribution, improving access to healthcare, etc.? Carsten, do I? Jointly. Okay. Uh... Well, um, I think this uh, part of the answer has been given uh, in the in, in Frauke's answer to the uh, to your, to the previous question. I think mega cities are not places where people constantly move, and that is also, I think, came out in uh, in the what I showed about the um, temporary construction workers who go back in case they are they are sick or they um, experience severe healthcare factors. Actually, um, in Asian megacities, we have a large population which is living trends locally, so they are not moving uh, for good to uh, to um, Pune or to um, Bangkok or something, but they sometimes have a very temporary um, yeah, status there. And I'm um, not really in favor of these classic push-pull models, uh, which are sometimes, I think, oversimplifying um, this idea. So. Of course, the conditions in rural areas do affect the uh, migration to cities, but I think uh, thinking simply in this push-pull categories is a little bit too easy for a real complex process, which is, I think, also not completely understood from a scientific point of view. Mm -hmm. There are migration networks. There are those who come for a certain span of years, for instance, for education or to just make a business and they go back. They are, um, it's not just rural, uh, rural urban migration. There's a lot of urban, urban migration. There are multifold um, seasonal, temporal forms of migration. Um, there are networks um, between, um, for instance, um, some um, urban areas up country to the mega city and forth. And many of the migrants, to say that very clearly, they are actually those with the best education. It's not that that only the poor come. Um, very many of them are the brightest, are the cleverest of um, of their origin. So they come to just get the opportunity to work and often go back. Also, what I'm what I'm missing is very clear policies in many countries in Asia. I'm not uh, not talking about all. In many countries, is a um, a clear political will of deconcentration, decentralization, and thereby a much more diversified urban network in a country. So that would prevent people from just going to the primate cities, where then um, a kind of a, of a circle starts, um, all, everyone is rushing to that, and then comes all this amplification of, of growth, um, which is unhealthy. So a much more diversified, polycentric urban system in many of the um, countries in Asia would definitely help. Thank you so much. I think this makes the perfect conclusion. I think a clear political will and a much more diversified approach is needed in many areas. 
thank you so much, our speakers, Professor Kraus and Dr. Butch, for being with us today and for your, for your valuable insights. Thank you to our partners, the German Center for Research and Innovation, DWIH New York, and its team. Thank you to the University of Heidelberg and Freiburg. And thank you all for joining us today for the first event in the series on megacities. And we hope that you will join us for the rest of the spotlights and for the joint event next year. Have a wonderful rest of this Friday and a great weekend. Thank you all.